Let me share my screen. Okay. So just today's session we're going to discuss about Apache Flink. It is basically real-time processing of data, mostly events and stream data which have been originating from different event sources and uh, we just got to get ourselves introduced about the apache flink how what are the basic concept of it and then we see the one of the implementation that we are currently working on okay so apache flink is basically a open source data processing platform it has a multiple integration both from the uh, data from different sources and it can also you know forward this data in a very low amount of time because it's use a client of internal state or in memory state that was the data processing that it can do is obviously much more faster than the your know, traditional event processing that is happen or the etl or batch processing we have in a different other frameworks so apache fling is also very low latency due to the in memory storage and it also can support high throughput or high level of processing of data. It is a stateful event processor. That means it manages the state of the application. And it can be distributed among number of nodes or in a cluster. So basically, Apache Flink has a two kind of node cluster. One is the master node. Another is the worker node. Worker node where that actual processing happen. So this uh, three major use cases the Apache stream can work is the application driven, event driven application where you listen from the event, real time events from different uh, things. For example, in our education domain, we have a concept for uh, capturing the user experience or user activity using a specific IMS global standard that is known as caliper events. So whenever the user interact with the educational application, it can open up a session, it can close a session, it can uh, go to click an assessment, a different operation it can do on different object. And other example, apart from the transaction interactivity, that particular application with the user may happen or application to application, events can be generated. Apart from that, it, apart from user click through, it can be the server specific logs that need to be stored and that need to be collected and the analysis need to be done. It is enabled to do that. It can also enable to integrate with IoT devices which are generating MQTT messages as well. So this site is basically your source application from which is basically collects the data to process it on the real time apart from the real time event processing it can also look up the data that is there into the database file system or key and value storage generally the cluster of the flink or the individual building block of flink are stored into a Kubernetes or competing Mesos orchestrator or the EN orchestrator servers. Okay. And it can use internally any kind of storage, being an ESB blob storage associated with the EC2 boxes. It can also store use an AWS S3 bucket 
or NFS or HDFS for big, uh, big data storages for his state management. And also event or transaction event, the difference between these three, right? Three use cases it support, that is event event. Events can happen on the real time a particular thing. For example, I have placed a new order into my, from my e-commerce website, right? That can be an event. User has launched an assessment on education domain, that can be event. Or streaming data, that means continuously the data is being streamed from a particular source. For example, a IoT device on the field is uh, sending the sensor de temperatures and other detail from an agricultural fields that observing is continuously sending the data that it can also process or it can process a batch analytics with the help of instead of you know triggering on everything it can in a chunk and read the data from the different csv files or particular sftv bucket or databases then after that it can also on the downstream Store the calculated data or analytics analyze data into a particular locations, which can be another event log, which can be it can send to an another uh, application be synchronous or asynchronous mode, maybe call an API, maybe push that into another event log, or maybe it can write to a database file system, a search in search server, or a key value store server. So now let's look into that's the basic uh, concept of Apache Flink. Now let's look into how it's what is the major three uh, thing it can support. So it's basically support uh, stateful computation. So stateful computation means when you are computing, for example, say I wanted to compute for a student right or for a user right how many time they visited a certain page or how many time they have searched or when they search for a particular products what are the different categories they have searched in say for a time window of a one week or one month right now that particular computed data that is the in a particular time window how many time the user have visited certain pages or search certain thing or they have open up a lessons right that or open up interacted with a lesson item that can be maybe in 24 hours that can be the analytical calculation that you wanted to do and this analytical computation can be done over the data that is either static or historical data for example the data is there into my data lake which is calculate uh, amalgamation of multi-year four five years of data of my business operation that bad process it can does it can listen to the real-time uh, data application data events that are occurred based on user activities like for example if they have launched a new pool how many times he says launch a course? For example, the course has been assigned to the user for a uh, year long course. Now, among that, I like to calculate okay, from this course is basically a uh, you know, combination of multiple uh, sections, right? Multiple sections in the sense that it has been uh, different objectives or different topic or different standards the individual lesson objects are being associated with the activity the video activity audio activity puzzle activity etc now from all those times the user have launches a course over the period of time i wanted to see okay for the time duration how many times that user have launches a course which is tied together against common standard Okay, and that is totally driven. It is not happening all the time when the user is launching the course that it is happening. So it is a data driven action on the part of services. It may be user driven, it may be application driven, right? 
or it like a streaming data that is coming from a data stream like an IoT device. It every five uh, seconds or every two seconds it's generating the particular temperature it's reporting and that can be you know sent and you can uh, wanted to see that how the temperature is moved over a period of time or maybe in a monthly or during a day how that temperature is been fluctuating for a width long of data that we collected when you collected the data what i need to do and how this is uh, existing solution looks like and how that can be you know replaced with apache flink we can take a look into each of the three use cases mostly where you use the apache flink this first example of the streaming data uh, streaming etl normally what is etl etl is basically you have a data that is stored into different areas different distributed applications and you wanted to collect all those data and try to store into your data warehouse so what you normally do you normally create a etl pipeline what this etl pipeline does it has like a scheduler feature where for each particular interval of a period maybe once in a day or two or three times in a day it's going to go in query the latest data from that particular data sources store the data as it is as per the data model from multiple sources into a staging database then compare the past data with the current data and then do the transformation into your application data model and then you push your data into your data warehouse and other databases so this etl jobs are what is the problem with the etl job they are run and manage on a run to be on periodic basis so that means if i'm running an etl job one day at a time so i'm not getting the all the updated data based analytics or computation on a real-time basis i have to wait for a day to get that particular data being appear or fetch data to be appear. For example, we have created a data reporting application where we are collecting data for student information system, LMS clouds like Canvas, Lano City, et cetera. We are seeing how this particular application is used by a, a district or a school, how the individual students are actually performing there. So we have to start, collect that student data from their internal database. Then from the external uh, you know, LMSs, I have to collect the sources. Then for the student information, I have to collect from another source, that is the SIS system. Then I have to combine the data, and this data are three different data models, right? So then I have to combine into a single data model. That is, we basically use the H5 as a common data model. And then I need to convert extract the data from different source location transform into it by data model and then load into my db but these things i'm doing in a maybe periodically so there is some gap between the last one and the current one i'm not always up to date with the latest data that is there so in that case that data pipeline can be migrated to the apache flink okay so from the Apache Flink, what is going to be happen? The data will be instantaneously available. Either it's a real-time event or transactional DB. It been ingested and it been ingested with low latency because in the Flink, the state is managed internally, right? And there is no additional data boundary, like you have a one boundary for storing the data as it is into the staging, then another boundary for transforming the data and putting the data into the database. Rather than you are storing the large amount of data in your local, and then you are writing or committing those data or appending those data to your targeted data warehouse or further event logs, right? So this can be not a periodic basic, it can become a real-time basis. But obviously, that will require your source application to be sending those real-time events when they want it to. But it uh, Flink can also read from your static data storage, 
and then can get the values. Another use case is basically based on the ETL that what we done is we have we need to calculate now additional reports or additional query view I need to provide to the end user. Now the business user or data analytics person can write queries on the fly on my data domain, on my data model that is on the source data that is there. And it can generate the ad hoc reports also. So now the if a, like a data analyst that is involved, he can fire up the query anytime he wants. But he is again, just like a previous example, he is again working with the same database, which is periodically query the application. So obviously, if the person is coming between the last data sync is happening say at the midnight and he comes and he wanted to query the data on the next day 10 a.m. Then obviously for him, the data is, uh, you know, older data, it's still data, right? But he can, you know, wanted to change the query, but he cannot see up on the updated query, the latest report or ad hoc report he wanted to generate. So that he can create interactive analytics or prototyping before you can do that. Now that can be addressed by Apache Flink because whenever the data being changed, it can listen to, now the data can be always keep updated. So only thing is the source system need to do is to provide the real time events that can be ingested and then the Apache Flink is basically querying, continuously querying the application, okay, and fetching the image uh, data that is there, doing the computation and continuously keeping our database updated. So when the data analytics person or data analyst comes and he write an ad hoc query, he always sees the latest amount of data and their time to load the data is very minimal. And for this, we don't need to depend on any serverless architecture or any kind of Lambda that is there. Now, the third use case is basically event-driven application. For example, say, I have a, in a bank, there is like a referral system is there. So that means when you take a particular bank credit card, you can refer to your friends or your family member to the bank credit card. Provided based on your referral code, if the particular person joins, you get a particular uh, bonus or additional benefit in terms of the credit, uh, additional credit value can be sent to your existing credit card. Now, if I wanted to create this uh, transactions, base or if application event based application what can i do i will have to first uh, wait for that event when that my friend or family member have been uh, listening to this uh, the new enrollment then obviously the enrollment can be happen so i need to figure it out whether that enrollment that is happened it's a referral enrollment or not so obviously that detail is not available with any serverless Lambda function. It's going to go out to the database and find out on this particular enrollment, the referral code is there in their referral database. From the referral database, it basically look up the detail and then it reads the data. And based on that, it took a decision, okay, based on a certain referral program, whether the user has given a sufficient amount of you know already get credited so there is they put a limit so that if the user has reached the limit for a certain duration if it does then it makes another call or maybe push that event to another lambda that lambda going to be uh, make another call so lambda wise lambda wise lambda the functions calls will get done and each of the operation what is happening will require some additional data to be pulled so it will take some time to get this operation done. So your compute and your actual transaction data is not in the same 
instance, right? They are in a different process. One process, your computation is happening. Another process, your transaction database is separate. Okay. So you react to the event or event will driven based on a command pattern. You get the data back, right? So state is stored in a separate remote database. So it will take some time to get that process. Now, same application, referral application can be created in a Apache Flink application. In that case, what happened is instead of you know storing this referral database in the separately, you store the referral database, you know, managing your state locally. And you can, you know, also save it to a persistent storage by periodically writing in asynchronous mode in a checkpoint system. So what is the checkpoint system is? So any kind of uh, infrastructure can be, you know, shut down or get it, uh, interrupted, right? You're processing a certain event. So what is the Apache Flink also guaranteed that only one single time processing? How is guaranteed single time processing? If there is any failure occurs, so periodically it stores its state into a checkpoint in a persistent storage. And if my system has been you know shut down, say for example, I'm listening from a Kafka streams, right? So Kafka streams have what it has a like a offset, message offset, the last message offset from which. The consumer, the Apache Flink, in this case, has listened that particular thing. So that particular offset is being saved into the chicks, uh, checkpoint. And when the checkpoint has been failed, you can back this checkpoint in a more durable storage, something like an HC bucket. And when that particular server is goes down, it can again restart from the last save checkpoint uh, from that checkpoint. It can also store the state and it can start processing. So that's how we, you know, save the states. It's not going to be only ensure that only one time the data being processed. It is not processed multiple times due to any failure. So as we are maintaining the state locally, so not that is a remote system. So it created uh, lesser time to, you know, process the things, right? And also, as I mentioned, is guaranteed single time processing and the state with a state checkpoint. And the, this is like a data and the logic are now sitting together in a microservice, single kind of a microservice, if you can say. And it can be highly scalable because you can scale your uh, Kubernetes cluster that is there, and then it can take the next set of action on that. Okay. So now comes what are the basic building blocks that I need to create to build my Apache Flink application. So for my Apache Flink application, I need to have an event stream. It can be your Kafka, it can be Kinesis, it can be Google PubSub, or it can be Apache Pulsar, right? So those kind of event stream that will give me real time data now next comes our business logic so business logic need to be saved into the in memory state okay so your business logic and state reside together and whenever that particular um, out of the box consistency or single time processing what you need to do whenever your event you are processing you the apache flink have a like a added timestamp to it. So it get to know that what is the event type and it ensures that it can handle events which are coming out of order or which are appearing late, right? So how it can do it, we can do come back to that. It basically it's read the event time of the so uh, your event stream and then it can have your snapshot so that means you can have like a state has been saved and then you have the option of if your state been corrupted you can restore that particular snapshot or 
say if you want to replay that particular event, you can replay them back. Okay, or you can do the time travel to the older event if you want to debugging any issues. So now how the state is processed? Here is a simple example. So here you are uh, processing from a particular source. Say this particular source is a data stream of a string. You are taking the lines of data stream and you are basically reading from a fling Kafka consumer. So you are reading from a Kafka stream or topic. Now after the source, what you can do from the lines of record that you have received, you can transform or call the map function on it okay and you convert that those stream either maybe string or json into your corresponding event object okay that is your normal pojo now after that event object what you can do you can done the transformation next transformation what you can do is you wanted to do some calculation on it right here what the particular statistics you wanted to capture so from the steam what you want to do you want to be give it a key like what is the main key or on which i want to do the calculation for example in our example in our you know data pipeline that we have built our main key object is the student or the student id so all our reports are based on the student. So what is the key based on which we want to derive the calculation? It may be student. It may be the content ID of a particular content. It may be a course ID of a particular content, or it may be a read ID of a particular content. For example, I wanted to see the how the student is performing. So in that case, the student ID will become the key. If I wanted to see how many times the particular course has been opened and the 100% completed by the different student, in that case, my course ID become my key. Or if I want to see how the organization the, or the school wise, the student are performing, then my key can become my organization ID. Okay. Next comes the time window. Time window means what is the time length of the events you wanted to capture? So I wanted to capture, say, last five seconds. What are the events you are getting from the source? Depends on which you wanted to do the calculation. Then you give a sum of calculation based on its own custom logic. OK. You may want to sum up the how many times the student has taken a particular assessment launch count. You can calculate. You can also calculate uh, how many times the student has uh, corrected the course. So if the student has corrected, you wanted to calculate. Okay, so if he corrected, find how many times that particular corrected data been happened for a particular content. So how many times it question? has been displayed to the student and out of those question what is the percentage student has got correct so all those calculation you can do it your own function then after that what you're going to do is you're going to be writing to your a particular path so add a sync here we are using rolling sync so it's going to be rolling appending to that same particular path to your data and Below is the logical view, how the data from the source and sync is transformed. So we're going to be have used the internal connectors that are available to the connecting to the source and sync. And then our responsibility will be after this configuration is how to do the transformation and then how to write the corresponding calculation. Now, here, uh, if I wanted to do the scalability of this, scalability can be increased. 
both your source processing can be parallelized your filter or transformation can be parallelized and locally it stored the data in memory so you can write your state by multiple processor and then also you can parallelly write to your sync to it so that mean parallel means multiple nodes can be creating this source filter and state read write and eventually writing after the state write it can write back to your sync okay so here is the example is when you are reading this you can also store the current state and where the consumers are or the source data are right so processes are where they are reading from so those values you can always store into a checkpoint into your programmer's product for example in a bucket or a file system Say for example, you are redeploying your application. So in that time when you did application, it will not going to be you know up. So even if you do say rolling update, then when that particular node comes back, so it can again read it from the same checkpoint and then it can rewrite the data. Now time is important, right? Where it is reading from. There are different times are involved in it. One is the event time. That means when does the user either uh, clicked, okay, or when actually the particular temperature is captured, or when that particular student has open launch test. That is the source event time or the source that event that gets triggered. Right. Then comes your broker time. Broker time means a connector to which the events are being pushed into a message queue or a Kafka or Kinesis kind of like a event stream. Okay, so whenever the mass event is being pushed into your message queue, that's the message queue itself going to create a time that is basically known as message broker or broker time. Then that particular data, when it's been read by the Flink's data source, that becomes known as a ingestion time. And then your window processing time is the window operator that we are using. That is known as your window processing time. When actually you are process start processing that particular record. So these times are important. Why? Because of which time you're going to be choose as a part of your checkpoint. And that particular part that you choose as a checkpoint is basically going to be to which it can be stored. For example, if I choose the broker time as my checkpoint, then when I'm going to be again become restored, what happened is that particular broker time or the consumer time. So those times are different, right? So it will help me to process the messages, right? So if you say messages are coming out of order, so in that case, what's going to happen if I choose the broker time, I can choose the broker time. Then when they have been ingested into the broker time, that may be I choose. So then it may so happen the event that have been actually originated. For example, the user has launched a course, he has navigated to the next question, he attempted the question, and he has exited that particular question, particular assessment or course. Now, these are basically the logical time that the business wanted to understand. So I need to go by the event time that is there. If I choose a broker time, it may happen the application which is producing the event, maybe have written that particular end message first, then your other message next, your navigation message next, then your launch message there. So even if we choose the broker time, what happens is you don't get that particular event line up in a proper sequence or order, right? It may so happen the broker time is all correct, but they are not in logical order. 
or maybe when you are reading the data or ingesting the data into the Apache Flink cluster, you may want to read the data, you know, kind of a first you read in a different order, maybe based on when the message has been received. So there may be two processors, which is source data source that are processing the event from the two partitions, right? So as the message being you know, duplicated into the partitions, right? One message has been read. So your complete may be read, and then in another partition, your launch has been read. So again, if you put the ingestion time, then what happened is they are not also appear in the correct order. So if we do the window operation on them, then your calculation will be wrong. So that's why it's better to choose your event time rather than the broker time or ingestion time because end of the day, the calculations that you're going to do is based on the logical or physical environment the events have been calculated. Okay, do you guys have any question before we move to the code? No, I guess. So. Let us see an example. Of Apache Pin project. Okay, so this is like a Maven project. Uh, so let us first investigate the form. So so this Spring, this is like a Spring Boot application which has been indicated with the uh, Apache Flink. So here the Apache Flink SDK has been embedded within the Spring application. You can either run the Apache Fling as a separate uh, application or you can integrate with uh, any of your Spring Boot application or Spring application. Right? Then it's uh, reading the data in a portable format. So what is Apache Fling do support in a different format of processing the data? It can process string, it can process JSON, it can process CSV, it can process some other binary data format. For example, Avro, Parquet, and PhotoBuff. So PhotoBuff format is the format that they're using. And this PhotoBuff message definition has been given in the messages.photo. So here they have describing the message. Only thing they have put out here is the string payload is equal to one, okay? It is depending on the PhotoBuff uh, three, right? and uh, it's basically you know taking a particular package and a class name so this uh, rat photograph is representing the object that from the photograph it going to convert it into converted into a java object Here we have let me try to when you compile this, this becomes the corresponding Java object, so it's automatically going to be 
converted into that particular field. So far, it's currently contained only the payload as a string and right? converted into the message object. This been automatically done. So it, this application is basically using Kinesis at its uh, source and Elasticsearch as its sync. Now the checkpoint what is maintaining is obviously it's maintaining uh, for the checkpoint. So for the data stream is the next uh, stateful and uh, we are using specifically the stateful function API. So what Apache Fling is provided, it provide uh, dynamic table kind of a format for querying the data. It provides SQL format of providing the data. It also provide data stream API. And, and we are currently looking into the stateful API. That is the fourth operation. So it's basically stateful function to which is basically provided. So here we are using the stateful kinesis IO. So we are reading from that particular source and the messages are mostly comes into a JSON format. So that's we have added the Jackson. Logback is basically for tracing uh, our logging purposes. Then you have the Elasticsearch. So direct Elasticsearch client is there to write into it. And some common utility. And then comes your state processing API which you can interact with the state and then you have the link distribution state function spring distribution and uh, different other internal dependencies that is there okay So then, okay. So now, uh, first of all, there is no other configuration as such, and see. So that being that, and now if I can look into what is the different uh, stateful function they have written, we can go over one stateful function that is there. So this functions that they have written is coming under the functions, okay. Okay, so they first have uh, extracted the stateful function implementation into the abstract stateful function, okay. So if we need to write any kind of stateful function, we have to implement this interface, okay. And then uh, what they are, you know, having different other things that they are maintaining. They are capturing the, how the data that is coming to and flow. But the major thing that they have in the stateful function is the invoke method. So invoke method is uh, doing what? It's basically having like a context and the object or the message or the event object, right? As the original events that are coming are encoded into the photo verb, so they are basically converting that into type casting that into a photo verb message, and further from the payload, they are creating another photo object. So basically, any kind of stateful functions that we can write in Java, Scala, and the Python language are inheriting your stateful function that is coming from Apache Fling HDK. And basically it has an invoke method within its function, 
which having a context and the actual payload object that is coming for your application. Apart from this, this particular interface, I don't see it's talking for any other method that we need to overlook. Okay. Now, in this stateful invoke function, that we have seen what you have to do this function doesn't return anything okay. so in this method what you need to do is you need to handle that particular event and do whatever operation you wanted to do it now then we can extend this function and based on our calculation we can write our functions that is there that will be required now here also they are doing is So now in your application, there may be multiple functions will be there. Now, which functions will be called on what kind of an event? For that, what you can do, you can create a route. Okay. So here the route has been created. Okay. And it's basically reading the port of message. Okay. And then on the based on photograph message, it then can route to a different function if needed to. Now out here, it has only, it has this method that is the route functionality. Okay. So this route functionality takes what? It takes the router downstream so if you need to pass this message to a particular another downstream function and it has the original message that is coming up into your application and then based on which it can choose which particular downstream function it can pass the message for processing okay so that's another component we can see is the router function here what they're doing is they're basically you know converting the payload into a particular another photo object by using the jackson object mapper uh, they basically converting into an object node and that particular object node is creating an envelope then from the envelope, the, from the object node, they are converting into a particular Java object by using a caliper message is our use case. So then they are, you know, the object type, they are putting the envelope object node. And from that, if the envelope is contains even, then they are creating an object and returning that. Either they are extracting a particular JSON like event are they instructing a particular node like caliper entity that being said so you get your object been converted out here now what you need to do is we need to route this particular object to different uh, location right so that they are doing is based on uh, this forward method where they choosing the downstream function they are choosing the function type then they are choosing the event object, whatever value they wanted to send, and the protobot message. Now, this forward function is 
taking the router downstream message and from the downstream message it has the forward type where you mention the function type so what is the function type is again if when you have a particular function what you are doing you are defining the particular function type right so out here here we have got an event that is egress event right and then it need to be forwarded to the egress stateful function now this particular stateful function has a function type it need to provide two things one is namespace one is type so namespace is you can give a namespace rat and the egress is that particular function so now this forward or downstream function doing what is forwarding based on the function type the key and the message towards that particular function so that will ensure that your messages has been forwarded now as we are using within the spring what we are doing is we are marking this router as a component so whenever the message that is being ingested into your application then it is automatically goes via this router and this routers has a main route function which is taking the message and the downstream function and then based on that it's choosing based on the function type id and the actual message and the downstream forward method is forwarding or routing to the actual stateful function where the stateful function has the invoke image where it's getting the actual context of execution and the payload and based on which it can choose different operations now how the particular application will start or how the application will know about things right so here our um, they are using a spring aware module so what is this particular spring aware module is doing it's basically taking it doing the basic configuration and it's creating different kind of spring uh, objects that are there. So one is that it's creating object mapper that is okay, and then it's also creating Elastic Search API. So it's interacting with the Elastic Search that is a downstream system. So it's just creating a bin for doing any kind of query from the persistent store if it requires, and then it has like a feature flag feature that what is currently engaging so this is basically uh, your configuration that they have provided now apart from that we have a stateful function module okay and in this stateful function module we are doing the all the configuration that is we need to do as a part of this of our stateful function application so first of all uh, they are creating the application context so any application we know spring we need to have a like application context need to be created okay so here if the application context is not available then they are using annotated config application context and spring aware module is basically which is creating that particular configuration from the application context and from the application context itself they are getting the spring aware module or the configuration and they are saying that 
module.config is your bobble configuration which is basically different your key value pairs and then you have like uh, the binder that is there and then the, you have create start your steam execution environment where you enable the checkpoint interval for every 60 seconds right so this way your application is getting booted up and you are you know setting up your checkpoint environment as well so that is the basic configuration that they are doing in a stateful function module that is there So here, uh, there are two files are there. One is the ingress spec, one is the egress spec. So here we are reading also from kinesis and also we are writing towards the kinesis. So when that particular message after processing, getting egress out of this application, okay. So they are first creating what is that output processor will be. So output processor identifier is going to be uh, just sending across the same message what is received internally. And also it's uh, choosing a particular uh, kinesis is using kinesis. So kinesis name they have chosen, their namespace they have chosen and the protocol of message they are going to be sending. The output request is the particular Kinesis topic, they're going to be egress out. So the kinesic egress builder they are building out here. That will be you know egress spec that they created. So here what they're doing is they are adding the from the configuration AWS region, the credential. Then they are choosing the maximum outstanding record can be 100. And with the serialization is the rat serializer. So where how the message will be serialized that they are using a rat serialization where they you know reading the internal message what is the protocol message they're going to have they're going to use the payload and on the payload they build a new egress record with the partition key in a payload hash code in the partition key that we need you know everything need to have a partition key of the kinesis messages then you have the payload that is in white with the stream that is mentioned is a rat stream to which they are going to be sending the message uh, definition or the record that is there. Similarly, uh, write your ingress stream or how we are reading from your source kinesis of stream, right? The consumer one. They are creating an ingress spec. Okay, first of all, they have the ingress identifier that is there, and they are reading from the input ingress kinesis of stream. And they're basically building a kinesis stream uh, ingress builder. They put in the your ID. Then they put what is the AWS region. So here is the AWS region is uh, based on the configuration. What is AWS region endpoint? If nothing is provided, then they choose US East one. And then they are choosing what is the AWS credential, default credential provider. And then they have RAD deserializer. So how they're going to be deserialize this particular message from the payload. That means from that uh, ingress report, whatever they receive, they're going to be deserialize that as a RAD protocol message with that particular payload as a string. Then they have like a stream name. Here the stream name is been provided from the configuration. Then where they're going to be start from of the last uh, for alias, they're going to be start from the alias message from the stream. Then they have like a certain configuration. What is that interval in millisecond to read the record? What is the record back of? base what is the max backup they're going to choose what is the back 
exponential constant they will increase what is the get record retry they're going to do 100 times they're going to be getting the start being discovered with that 50 milliseconds and adapter read or not so those things are basically defined and now they are basically creating default RNS stream same way they have using the backfill RNS system if the messages need to be backfilled again due to any processing errors and if we look into the ingress stream where this being used it is used in the spring builder and in stateful function binder both have your default analysis in place and your backfill ingress also they have registered uh, default ingress id and the uh, rat message and backfill message routers and build egress they have made that and function provider they are sending that that is coming from the binder which is actually going to look into all the function providers that is uh, we haven't configured this function provider anywhere let's see this component so function provider is stating what is the stateful function where the functions are there right so functions are there into my application in this location in this package where all the different kind of functions are there so we're going to explore another function and then from the application context that is a storing and then they are saying that after property set method because this is i think is an application context aware that interface they do to initializing bin also so after the property has been set like a spring application they are stateful base class they are taking up the function types they're putting the function types and then they're putting the function class what is the class name they get stateful base package and that's the basic thing uh, they are putting there and function of type they can pass a function type and they can get a stateful function from this now let us uh, look into one of the student stateful function so it is inheriting from the abstract stateful function and abstract stateful function they have like a method called handle message so this handle message is internally called with the same after converting from the basic invoke message of the main stateful function then they converted this uh, payload into tailpipe envelope and the context object they are sending. From the envelope, we are getting the caliper event. From the caliper event, we can get the corresponding event that is there, that is uh, like a either student user membership or organization. If it is like a student event, then we are having like internal method where they are capturing that. Now, student can be created, modified, activated, or deactivated based on event action. This is totally a logic depending on the payload. Now, here we are doing getting the student object, user object, what we got from the event. We are getting an user, getting the student ID. We are checking whether the state. Now, where is the state come? States is the persistent value state right so this persistent value student model state is basically the state this particular function will use okay like so far we have read that the states are there along with the computation so if you wanted to get a particular state you get the persistent annotation and the persistent value that is the student model so i can choose my own data type and can choose my own model class to store the state and state name is basically here is the basically state that's the normal state we have mentioned and these are being used in a different function states but these functions are uh, when they are storing their persistent value 
they're storing a different type of value. Now, now let's move back to our uh, function for handling student events, right? So when you're handling student events, uh, what they are doing is they're creating a model. Either they're uh, looking up the student ID. If the student ID is not present, then they are creating a default model on the state itself. Okay, new student model and they are setting sending the ID, and they are looking up on the state itself. Okay. Now get user to the student model mapper and transfer. So they're basically getting a mapper. Based on that, they are transforming the student user object to the student object, and then they are upsetting the particular state and the model. So then what is do whatever calculation they do, whatever transformation they do. Like here in the transformation, what they're doing there for each of this object, they have created different mapper objects. And this mapper object is converting one object to the another object. That is the transformation that they're doing. Here, I don't uh, think they are doing any kind of calculation per se, but they are uh, storing the event equals to this created. So if they are created, then they're going to be storing the student into their local state. Okay. And then after that, the egress API, they are now writing these things into the elastic search index that they are currently doing. Okay. And obviously, after this event gets processed, it will automatically go to the output stream, output kind of system. Let's see another example where the stateful function is actually doing some operation. For example, let's see the item prof stateful function. So, what is this item prof stateful function is doing? It is again a stateful function, and this stateful function has a function name, function type. So, if you quickly see where this particular function type has been used. We're going to be seeing this particular function type has been used out here. Where what kind of event has been you know channelized to him? Okay. So here we can see the grade event when it is done. That particular grade event has been forwarded to it. Because here the downstream system is coming, downstream method is coming, the router downstream. And outer downstream, this method is getting that events. And from the events, it's uh, either getting null for different kind of contain URL is basically creating. Okay. And contain URL here is being used to send this object back. And contain URN if it's null, then it's okay. And then they're taking the date. Okay. And then they're basically combining to, to create a unique ID for that particular message. Okay. That they're basically going to be used to store it to the elastic search. And when they basically forward, then this thing get forwarded and this thing get process out of the box. And in this particular item function, what it's doing? It's doing some calculation. So what kind of calculation is doing? Let's see. So when you say it's handling the great event based on the payload, it creates a state model. So state model is actually what is going to be stored into the state. Right. So first, initially, it initializes the state model from the actual model. 
and in this model what they are doing they are mapping one object into the another object that they are currently doing that is a transformation and then after when that another object it comes then they basically calculating the student id right so previously what they have in the state right they have the student id so they are storing the student id in the so if i say the student ids right student id is being you know stored within the application or the state model so from the state model itself when they particularly extract that state from the state model because they are calling state dot get okay from state dot get they are not passing any ids or anything they are getting the object so whatever state that is there from that particular state depending on the time window they are getting the state and then they are going to accumulate so based on whatever the currently the in memory the student ids are stored they are getting them as a set and as there may be same student is uh, application launching multiple event or it able to grade itself then what happened is that particular student id is added to that particular set so there is no duplicate and then then setting that particular state back okay and similarly they are doing the what is the number of score that is given right so mutable score they get from the list and then they are adding the score to so this have been all sum up similarly what are the different origin domain from which the request has been come that has been also captured now after that what they're going to do they're going to be upsetting the state so that means again the item drift model will be stored into the state before the next event comes when the next event comes they have failed they use the internal state and by which they are going to be writing that particular state into our memory and by this it is able to process all the operation much more faster than reaching out to a database but it do uh, reach out to elastic cache to store the model id because it's using the same model so when it's going to be putting that into the index it just override the index record that is there so that is the one example of the stateful function how this is done how we can integrate the stateful function uh, within the spring application how we can write stateful function how we can write uh, do different configuration for consumer ingress and egress specs module specific modules and that's uh, what we did so any specific question you guys have Hello. Hello, sir. Yeah. Sir, what is this project all about? Yeah, this project is all about is to uh, they are as I mentioned there are like uh, four APIs that are available within the Apache Flink. So in this project, they are actually capturing doing the stream process analysis. So we have seen the certain use cases of the Apache Flink, right? Okay, so this is specifically for data stream processing, real time result from data stream, right? So what is basically doing is a part of this is creating data analysis or stream analytics because it's calculating, for example, the item preference we seen, right? So in that case, what happening? We are written the stateful functions. And in, as a part of the stateful function, what we did is we basically, for a particular item, we are seeing how many students has been attempted the particular item, how they are, you know, performed against that, how many number they have got, and that particular state details, we are periodically, we are live, every message, we are calculating that because we are storing that state into the memory. 
we are calculating that for each item and putting into our elastic search that can be viewed in a live report on the dashboard so creating a live report from the real time events that are happening within the application to create a steam analytics so that is the use case for it okay okay it is not bad processing because here when the events are happening then the apache flink is basically working and as i have seen shows you that the particular state that is there it's reading from the state it has for the particular item what is the number of students are there what is the number of origin domain from this thing is originating so those details are coming from there so that's the particular steaming analytics is basically a scope of this project where each stateful function is doing some calculation or transforming the data and storing into the elastic search form which we are building up reports to be displayed on the dashboard okay any other questions If not, then we can close the session now.